all right so let's get started so today we are going to finish up the last uh, important topic that's left in chapter 9 which is rotational inertia okay so rotational inertia of an object is a quantity which determines how difficult it is to change the object's rotational state which which just means to change the object's angular velocity right so let me explain this suppose you have suppose you have a frictionless surface and then you have a large a mass m uh, attached to a rod and the other end of the rod is fixed uh, fixed so the rod can basically pivot around this point let's call this point o the rod can pivot around this point right and so uh, and it, it can freely pivot around this point and the mass m is sitting on a frictionless surface so uh, you can rotate this mass m in a circle like this and let's just assume that the rod is very light and hardly has any significant mass uh, the point mass is uh, where all the mass is Okay, and let's say that the length of the rod is r. All right, now suppose you're asked to rotate this system, right? Just push on it and make it rotate. All right, so um, you give it a try and you, you manage to rotate it. Now, just imagine that you just did that, right? Now, suppose I ask you this question. I have the same exact setup, but this time I've doubled the mass m. So instead of having m, you have 2m, right? Is it going to be easier or harder or the same effort to rotate it to the same angular velocity that you rotated the last one? So let's say that the last one you rotated, you'd managed to rotate that to 10 RPM in one second or something like that. Would it be the same amount of effort or easier or harder to rotate this second system, let's call this one, let's call this two, uh, to the same angular velocity in the same amount of time? you would probably guess that it's going to be harder and you're going to be right. So it is harder to rotate. It's, it's in fact going to be twice as hard to rotate this to the same angular velocity in the same amount of time, right? So we say that the rotational inertia in the second case is greater than in the first case. The rotational inertia just measure, is a measure of how hard it is to rotate something, to uh, um, how hard it is to change the rotational state of an object. All right, now let's look at one more example. Suppose I give you the same setup again, but this time I increase the length of the rod to 2r. I keep the mass m as it is. And then I ask you to rotate this system uh, to the same angular velocity in the same amount of time, right? Uh, will it be easier or harder? You might be able to guess the answer from intuition. Uh, it's actually gonna be a lot harder to rotate this. In fact, uh, to be precise, it's going to be four times as hard to rotate this. Right? So you, you're going to have to spend a lot more energy to rotate this to the same angular velocity in the same amount of time. So the rotational inertia in this case is even greater. Right? So, so just to uh, uh, summarize this, rotational inertia is a measure of how difficult it is uh, to change the rotational state of an object, to change the omega of an object. right? All right, now let's, talk, let's look at the simplest formula for rotational inertia. The rotational inertia of a point mass, so the rotational inertia of a point mass, uh, notice that rotational inertia is also called moment of inertia. I use both these terms. Moment of inertia is kind of the older term and nowadays books call it rotational inertia. So the rotational inertia of a point mass, what is that going to be? So we already looked at this system. So suppose you have a, a, a point mass which is at a distance r from the axis of rotation. The axis of rotation pass, passes through the point O. And this is the mass m uh, which rotates in a radius r about the point O. The rotational inertia, symbol for that is i. You know that in physics all the symbols are off so rotational inertia happens to be i actually i kind of makes sense for inertia so rotational inertia for a point mass is going to be mr square and that's the formula for the rotational inertia of a point mass 
Now, how would you find the rotational inertia of an extended object? So what do I mean by that? So let's say that I have an axis which is passing through this point, right? And I have an object which, uh, so the axis is an imaginary line which is coming out of the board passing through this point. And I have an object which could be anything, but let's just take, let's just consider a disk. So this disk is rotating about this axis which passes through the point O. It's a solid disk. So how would you find the rotational inertia of this disk? Well, one way of doing it, a logical way of doing it, would be to break up this disk into a set of small segments like this. Let's say that this segment has a mass m1, right? The total mass of the disk is capital M, let's say. And this segment, this little segment that I made of the disk, is at a distance r1 from the rotation axis. Now, I know how to find, if, if m1 is very small, I can treat it as a point mass, and I know how to find uh, the moment of inertia of a point mass. So the moment of inertia of just this m1 will be m1 r1 squared, right? Then I can take another segment of the disk, disk somewhere, maybe over here, and let's say that this little segment is at a distance r2, and it has a mass m2. So the moment of inertia of the neck of the second segment that I considered would be m2 r2 squared. And similarly, I can keep doing this. I can keep taking segments uh, everywhere on the disk until I've covered the entire disk. And I can get the total moment of inertia. So i would be summation mi ri squared, where i runs over all the segments that I made, right? Now, you know that this will not give you, uh, this will give you an approximate answer just because the segments mi are not actually point masses. Like they're small, but they're not actually point masses. So until you make them real point masses, uh, you will not get an exact answer, right? You'll get an uh, approximate answer. If you make these m1s a lot smaller, m1, m m is a lot smaller, then your answer will be closer to the correct answer. But only when you make these mi's infinitesimally small, then you will get the most accurate answer. So the moment of inertia accurately would be the limit of this sum, mi tending to zero, right? Summation uh, mi ri square. On the PowerPoint slide, I just call this mi as delta mi pretty much the same thing. So that would ideally give you the most accurate answer, right? Now, how do you actually find this? So this quantity that I just wrote down can be expressed in the form of an integral. So if the mi goes to zero, so each, each mi is very, very small, then you can consider it dm, a tiny element of mass. And that dm is located at a distance r from the axis of rotation. So this formula just, the mi is replaced by dm, ri is just replaced by a generic r, right? And the sum just is replaced by an integration. Right? So this is the accurate formula for rotational inertia. And what this formula is saying is that if you have, it's pretty obvious what it's saying, but I'll just say it again. If you, if you want to find the rotational inertia of this disk or any, any object, in fact, let me not make it a disk, let's just make it some weird shaped object. Suppose this weird shaped object is rotating around an axis and this axis need not even be centrally located. Let's say it's rotating around an axis which passes through this point O, right? So the moment of inertia of this, of this weird shaped object to find that, what you would do is you would take a tiny element of mass somewhere over here. This, this mass is truly, truly, truly tiny. And so we are going to call it dm, which means that it's infinitesimally tiny. And uh, this dm is located at a distance r from the axis of rotation. So you calculate r squared dm 
that would give you the moment of inertia of just this little point mass, right? And then if you add up all such contributions from every dm on the object, the sum of all that is represented by this integral. And that would give you the moment of inertia. So I hope that the definition of moment of inertia is clear to all of you. At this point, you might be thinking, how can you possibly ever calculate this in practice? Like this seems like, uh, conceptually, uh, conceptually this seems like, uh, uh, this is something that you could only do conceptually. Uh, you cannot do this in practice, but it is actually possible to figure out the actual moment of inertia uh, using methods of calculus, right? Uh, you don't need to um, be too scared at this point. We are not going to get too much into those calculus methods, but I just want you to conceptually understand how the moment of inertia is calculated, right? So, I, so what we've discussed in this slide is how to find the moment of inertia of a point mass. It's just m r squared, m is the mass, r is the distance from the axis. And if you wanted to find the moment of inertia of an extended object, you could break it up into a bunch of point masses, calculate the moment of inertia of all of them. So for each point mass, it's just dm times r squared. And adding them all up gives you, which is the process of integration, and that gives you the moment of inertia of the entire object. All right. Now, here are some properties. In the next slide, we're going to talk about some properties of moment of inertia. Okay, so first of all, notice that moment of inertia is uh, analogous uh, to the mass. Uh, you know that there is inertia associated with mass. We talked about that a long, long time ago. Mass is a measure of inertia. Uh, we talked about how if you have a large object uh, like a truck, uh, that is very difficult to get moving, right? So uh, you, you would probably not be able to push, uh, make a truck move by pushing on it. Uh, or if a truck is already rolling towards you, you would not be able to make it stop because it would take an enormous amount of force to change its state of motion or change its velocity, right? So, uh, but on the other hand, a small uh, mass like a pebble, you can easily get it to move or get it to stop if it's already moving. And that's because uh, it has a lot less inertia. So inertia that we studied earlier is quantified by mass, right? The rotational inertia that we are studying now is very similar in spirit, but it applies to rotational motion, right? So an object which has a large rotational inertia is difficult to spin up or spin down or get it to rotate. Um, and if it has a small rotational inertia, it's very easy to uh, spin up or spin down, right? Okay. Now, one difference between inertia that we studied earlier and rotational inertia is that inertia just depends on mass, but rotational inertia depends both on the mass and how that mass is distributed relative to the axis of rotation. In particular, if you have a lot of mass distributed away from the axis of rotation, then the rotational inertia is greater. So let me give you an example of that. Consider Consider a shape like this, a disk, uh, not a disk, let's, let's, let's take a, uh, a square. Let's say, let's take a square plate, right? A solid square plate. Um, and uh, it's, it's completely solid. Let's say it has a mass M, right? And suppose you are rotating this disk about an axis which passes through the center of this disk. So it rotates about the imaginary line which passes through the central point uh, and is perpendicular to the plane of the disk. All right, now consider this and compare it with this object, which has exactly the same mass. So if you put these on a scale, they would weigh exactly the same, but it's a more a frame. So all the mass is in this region and the inside part is hollow. Suppose you have to rotate this frame uh, about uh, the same point, which is at the center of the square, right? Which has more rotational inertia? Think about this for a moment. The correct answer is this one has a greater rotational inertia. And this one has less rotational inertia. Can you tell me why? The reason is for uh, the frame, there is more mass away from the axis of rotation. All the mass is spread out 
far away from the axis of rotation. There's hardly any mass uh, near the axis. Whereas for the solid, solid uh, square, uh, all the mass is spread out uniformly. And so there's a lot of mass which is pretty close to the axis of rotation, right? And so as a result of that, the moment of inertia is, is smaller. Why is the moment of inertia smaller? Remember, moment of inertia is calculated by a quantity like this. You can either write the integral version or you can write it as a sum, it doesn't matter. The moment of inertia is calculated, in principle is calculated from a formula like this. So summation mi ri square. Just imagine evaluating the sum for the solid square and for the frame, right? If you evaluate it for the solid square, you get a lot of masses which have small ris and you have some masses which have large ris, right? What about if you calculate this quantity for the frame? Now all the mass, all the mass elements uh, that you make uh, will be far away from the axis of rotation because a large part of this frame is hollow. So all the mass is distributed far away from the axis of rotation. So the ris will be large. Whereas over here, you will have some, some ris will be large and some will be small. So the overall sum is larger in this case. So the point is that if you have more mass away from the axis of rotation, uh, you have a greater rotational inertia. And what does, uh, and the fourth point on this PowerPoint slide, uh, slide 21, is, is what we've just been talking about, that a higher rotational inertia means that it's a greater resistance to a change in its rotational state. Okay. So on the following slide, I have a table which has a list of rotational inertias. Now you don't need to memorize any of these rotational inertias. Even when we have this class on ground, uh, I tell the students that uh, you can have this table on your um, formula sheet. So you never have to mo uh, memorize this table. This table just gives you the rotational inertias of different shapes. Uh, there, are, there is a similar table in your textbook. Uh, you can either follow that. I think the one in your textbook is more colorful. Uh, you can either follow that or this, it doesn't matter. So here are some common shapes for which the moment of inertia is given. Um, one point uh, which I should have emphasized in the previous slide uh, is that I told you that moment of inertia is a quantity that depends on the mass and how that mass is distributed relative to the axis of rotation. Uh, so the axis of rotation is another factor that plays a role in determining the moment of inertia. So let me just quickly clarify that. So suppose you have, so the point that I'm making here is that axis um, rotational inertia depends on the axis of rotation. So let me just clarify. It should be fairly obvious to you now, but I'll just clarify it. Suppose you've got a disk and you're considering its rotational inertia about an axis which passes through its center, right? So that quantity, so once again, think about what rotational inertia means. Summation mi ri squared, right? So that, that means you're gonna take these tiny little mass elements, mi, and calculate the r's for each one, and then add them all up. So add up all these quantities, mi ri squared, uh, to get the rotational inertia, right? Now suppose you do the same exercise but for a different axis of rotation. Let's take our axis of rotation to pass through this point. So this disk is kind of rotating around an imaginary line, uh, which passes, which it's perpendicular to the plane of the disk and passes through this point O. So in this case, the rotational inertia will be uh, completely different because you would take the same, uh, you would again take tiny elements of mass, uh, mi, and this would be, this is the ith element of mass and this is its distance from the axis of rotation. Now, if you evaluate the same sum, it's obvious that you'll get a different answer because all these mi ri's, the sum mi ri squared would be completely different because all these ri's are different than over here, 
because you're, you're using a different axis, right? So the I will be completely different. So rotational inertia depends on the axis of rotation, right? Okay, can you tell me which case will the I be greater? The correct answer is that um, the I will be greater for the second case. So this will be a greater I. And that is because uh, you have more mass distributed away from the axis of rotation than you have in, in the first case. Okay, and that's the difference between rotational inertia and ordinary inertia. So ordinary inertia that we studied earlier uh, depends only on the mass. That's the only thing that it depends on. But rotational inertia depends not only on the mass, but it also depends on how that mass is distributed relative to the axis of rotation. So you can the same object can have completely different rotation of uh, rotational inertia for different axes of rotation. All right. So you can see that in this table. So let's consider the rotational inertia of a disk. Uh, so all of these can be calculated using calculus. And if we were doing this class on ground, uh, I would have probably shown you a couple of examples of how to calculate this using calculus, but we'll skip that for now. Uh, if you're interested, you can see, uh, I think your book discusses how to calculate the uh, rotational inertia and might have a few examples of actually calculating these, but it's not necessary for, for this course. Uh, okay, so the rotational inertia of a disk about an axis which passes uh, about a central axis, uh, they're calling it a hoop here, uh, about a central axis, so, so this one, this is the one we're talking about, is going to be uh, just mr square, i is equal to mr square, right? And then for a cylinder, you have this formula. Uh, for, a, uh, yeah, for a solid cylinder, uh, you have this formula. We end up using this one quite a bit. It's going to be half uh, capital M R square. That is the rotational inertia of a cylinder about uh, its central axis, solid cylinder about its central axis. Okay. Then um, another one that we often use is the rotational inertia of a rod. Uh, about uh, an axis which passes through the center of the rod and is perpendicular to the rod. And that is 1 12th ml square. M is the mass of the rod, L is the length of the rod, right? Uh, one more that we often use is the rotational inertia of a disk. So we use this one and we also use this one. The rotational inertia of a disk is the Um, is it, of mass m and radius r uh, through an axis uh, about an axis which passes through the center of the disk is uh, two fifths m r square. Right. So you don't need to memorize any of these, and you also don't need to worry about how these are derived. They are just derived by integrating the equation uh, m r uh, r square d m. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's how you calculate. Uh, rotational inertias of various shapes, various common shapes. All right, uh, let's talk about some practical applications of rotational inertia. So a tightrope walker, let me see if I can make this into presentation mode. Okay, so a tightrope walker uh, carries a long pole to increase his or her rotational inertia. Now let's think about why a tightrope walker would want to uh, carry a long pole, right? One reason is the following. So let's imagine that the tight rope is coming out of the board here, right? And that and the uh, person standing on it uh, This is our tightrope walker and he's sort of walking out of the board. The tight rope itself is coming out of the board, right? So What is this guy's moment of what is the axis of rotation? Clearly the axis of rotation is the rope itself, is the line passing through the rope. And uh, the person might rotate either this way or this way as a result of gravity, right? So in order to prevent himself from rotating or making it harder for him to rotate, what he can do is he can increase his moment of inertia. And one way of doing that is to have this tight rope, uh, have a pole like this. So if he holds on to this pole, 
then his moment of inertia is, mu is much greater about the axis passing through the point O. We'll just call this point as O. Why is that? Remember more mass away from the axis of rotation? Now you have all this mass which is distributed quite far away from the axis of rotation and so the moment of inertia of the man and his uh, pole uh, about uh, the tightrope uh, is going to be much larger, right? So that's, that makes it harder for gravity to rotate him, okay? Um, all right, there's, an, there's another reason why they'd hold on to the pole like this because first of all, it's difficult for gravity to rotate them, but gravity can still rotate, rotate them. So they, they will eventually start to fall, uh, but they will fall more slowly. They will rotate much more slowly. And once they detect that they're about to uh, fall, they can correct themselves using the pole as well. So that's another reason why they have the pole. So uh, the reason that they have the pole, one reason that they have the pole is to increase their moment of inertia. And second reason is it allows them to uh, apply a correction or right themselves if they're starting to fall. Now, you might have noticed, so we talked about this. You might have noticed that uh, suppose you ever suppose you're standing and you lose your balance and you're about to fall over you will notice that uh, you suddenly spread out your arms right uh, that's an instinctive reflex that you have when, whenever you're falling over you'll notice that you tend to uh, spread out your arms why is that it's exactly for the same reason when you spread out your arms you have more mass distributed away from the axis of rotation and that increases your rotational inertia okay um, the third point is an interesting demonstration which I love to show in class and it's so sad that I'm not able to show it. Anyway, so, so the point is that suppose you take a rod like this and uh, you attach a heavy mass somewhere over here and this is something that I do in class. You attach a heavy mass over here. Let's say that this end of the rod is A and this end of the rod is B. I, I don't think I needed to name them. And suppose you want to balance this rod on one end, right? Would it be easier to balance it, uh, put your finger under A and balance the rod? Or would it be easier to put your finger under B and balance the rod? If you can set this up at home, if you have a rod and if you can attach something heavy to one end of it, uh, you can try this yourself. Uh, most people, when I ask this question in class, they'll say that it's probably easier to balance the rod like this. So, uh, with put your finger over here at A, uh, that would be easier to balance, like if your finger is at point A. But it turns out that it's a lot easier to balance the rod if your finger is at the other side. So if you have the mass uh, higher up. So why is, why is it easier to balance the rod when the mass is far away from your finger? The answer is because in this configuration, so this is configuration one and this is configuration two. So in configuration two, the rod is, um, the moment of inertia of the rod is much larger. So the axis in this case is a line that passes through point B perpendicular to the rod, right? And the rod is trying to rotate about that line. Gravity is trying to rotate the rod about that line. So you can see that configuration two will give you a greater moment of inertia because you've got more mass distributed away from the axis of rotation, right? So configuration two gives you a greater moment of inertia. So that means it's harder for gravity to rotate the rod about that axis which gives you more time to apply corrections the moment you find that the rod has begun to topple. Right? So, uh, so it's easier to balance a top heavy object at the lighter end. All right? uh, another interesting example, practical application of this is the following. Uh, suppose, suppose you have, um, all right, so let me just go, I don't think I have enough room to write here. So suppose you are, uh, walking somewhere, right? Uh, let's say that you're walking to class and you find out that you're quite late, so you start to walk as fast as you possibly can, right? Um, so you're power walking now, you're walking as fast as you can. You will notice, if you power walk for a few minutes, you will notice that it's actually easier to maintain the same speed at which you're going if you jog instead of power walk, right? Uh, 
Now, how long you can maintain that jog depends on your cardio fitness, but for a given speed, jogging is a little bit easier on your body than, uh, than power walking. And if you don't believe this, you can just give it a try yourself. And, and you'll find that it's certainly easier to jog at a certain pace than it is to power walk at that same, same pace. Why is that? So let's think about your leg for a moment. So your leg, when you're walking, you keep your leg straight. Right? That's the definition of walking. So this is your leg. What is the axis of rotation of your leg? It's this imaginary line that passes through your hips, right? And uh, this, I'll just write a little O here. So the axis of rotation is this imaginary line which passes through your hips, right? And your leg is rotating back and forth about that axis, right? So that is when you walk. But when you jog or run, you are bending your knees, right? So when you're jogging or running, your leg looks like this. Which of these has a greater moment of inertia? Obviously, uh, this has a greater rotational inertia. The straight leg has a greater rotational inertia. And the bent leg has a lower rotational inertia. So as a re result of that, it's easier to rotate uh, your bent leg, which has a lower rotational inertia. Um, and so it's easier for you to uh, jog than it is to walk. Right. Okay. All right, let's try this. Uh, I'm so used to saying, let's try this top hat question. This would have been a top hat question. Uh, so a hoop and a disc of the same mass are rolled down an incline and they roll without slipping. Which one will reach first? Okay. So you have uh, an incline and uh, you drop, uh, so you have a, a hoop which looks like this. And you have a disc which is solid. Assume that they have exactly the same mass. So if you put them on a scale, they'll weigh exactly the same. And uh, they have the same radius, right? So which of these will reach first if you roll them both down the incline? So let's, let's actually watch this. See if I can show you a video from here. So the sound doesn't come through, but that's that's just fine. Okay. Oh, so I think I need to fast forward this to. Yeah, I think this is where he starts. Okay. So you can see that it's the disc that reaches first, right? And you can watch this entire video and he's going to, he explains the whole thing. Uh, but you should be able to tell what, you should be able to uh, answer uh, why that is the case. So you should be able to explain why that is the case. This has a greater rotational inertia, greater rotational inertia, and this has a lower rotational inertia. And so as a result of that, the, it's harder for gravity to get the uh, hoop to start rotating because it's got a greater rotational inertia and it's a lot easier for gravity to get the disc which has a lower rotational inertia to start rotating and so the disc begins to rotate much uh, faster and, and so it wins the race. Um, okay and, and once again uh, this should be fairly clear to you now but once again why does the uh, hoop have a greater rotational inertia? because of the simple rule that more mass away from the axis of rotation gives you a greater rotational inertia. For the case of the disc, most of the mass is located away from the axis of rotation. So if you imagine evaluating the sum, summation mi ri square, uh, this will give you a larger answer uh, for the disc, for the hoop than it does for the disc. Okay. Oh, okay.
So in the next slide, I think I have a fully worked out example. So you can just do this on your own. Okay. I'll just go back to the other view. You can just do this on your own. Um, correct. And uh, sorry, this one uh, you can do on your own. Uh, there is one more piece of information that we need in order to calculate rotational inertia and it is called the parallel axis theorem. So what is the parallel axis theorem? So let's go back to our Word document. Okay. So we talked about how if you have a disk, uh, then that's going to have a certain rotational inertia about an axis which passes through its center and is per perpendicular to the disk, right? In fact, if you look it up uh, in the table, it's going to be one half mr squared. If the radius of the disk is r, mass of the disk is m, then the rotational inertia would be one half mr squared and this is just from the table okay now you, we talked about how if you measure the rotational inertia about a different axis so suppose now the axis of rotation is passing through a point at the edge of the disk right it's a line perpendicular to the disk and it's passing through a point at the edge of the disk what is the rotational inertia going to be it's going to be quite different because we have a different axis of rotation. There is a way of figuring out uh, the rotational inertia. If you happen to know the rotational inertia about an axis which passes through the center of mass of the disk. Right? So we know what the rotational inertia is about an axis which passes through the center of mass of the disk and that's what we just wrote down earlier. So we're going to call that ICM. So ICM happens to be uh, one half mr square right but we are interested in the i which is the uh, i for the axis which passes uh, through, through our other axis which uh, passes through the edge right so let's call this point o and this let's call this point a so the rotational inertia about an axis which passes through o is just the center of mass rotational inertia icm so that's just going to be half mr square and we want to know what is the rotational inertia about another axis which passes through a different point a right now if the two axes are parallel to each other there is a way of getting i in terms of icm so the answer is that i will just be equal to icm plus a correction factor and that correction factor is the mass of the object multiplied by the distance between the two axes squared so in this case, the distance between the two axes, let's call that uh, D. In this case, the distance between the two axes is just going to be R. So D is just R in this case, right? So let's, let's just work this out as an example. So I about I through the point A, uh, I about an axis which passes through the point A would just be one half MR squared plus M times d is just r in this case because the two axes are separated by one radius so that so one half mr square plus mr square so that's three halves mr square is the i about an axis which passes through the point a so if you happen to know the rotational inertia of an object uh, about its uh, about an axis which passes through its center of mass then you can find the rotational inertia about any axis that's parallel to that uh, center of mass axis using the parallel axis theorem. So this is the statement of the parallel axis theorem. Let's go back to the PowerPoint and look at this nicer diagram. So here you've got a weird shaped object. The center of mass is shown. And you happen to know the I about the center of mass, about an axis which goes through the center of mass. Let's call that ICM. 
where is my diagram okay yeah let's call that icm now if you're asked to find the i about an a, an axis which is parallel to the center of mass axis uh, but at a distance d away from it so this axis then you can easily find i using the parallel axis theorem so it's just going to be icm plus md square we are not going to get into the proof of this theorem um, so uh, it's you're just going to use it uh, you don't have to worry about how this theorem is proved okay let me uh, so this example is useful uh, so we're going to actually do this one okay let me just go back to so uh, this is an important example so please make sure you work through this one this is fairly simple so it, there's also a hint so you can do this on your own um, I'm going to work through um, this example and uh, before I do that I'll also I'll just do one more example and then then we, we can look at this one as well all right so let's try an example which is the following find oops what happened so this is an example Find the rotational inertia of a thin rod about an axis passing through one end of the rod and perpendicular to it. So here's the question. So we have a thin rod and we want to find its rotational inertia about an axis which passes through one end of the rod. The mass of the rod is given, it's m, and the length of the rod is l. Okay, okay so how do we do this? If first thing that you would want to do is look through the table and see if, if this shape is on the table. Unfortunately, this shape is not on the table. However, from the table you can find that if the axis passes through the center of mass of this rod we do have we do know what the rotational inertia is for an axis which passes through the center of mass of the rod let's call that icm so icm from the table would be 1 12th ml square and this just comes from the table i didn't do anything fancy all right i need to find the i about a parallel axis which passes, which is uh, at a certain distance from the center of mass axis. Right? All right, so let's see if we can figure it out. You should be able to do it yourself. So we will obviously use the parallel axis theorem. So I would be equal to ICM plus MD square. Right? So ICM is 1 12th ML square plus M. D is the distance between the two axes. This is our D. What is the D in this particular problem? Obviously, it's half the length of the rod, right? So D is just L over 2 squared. And that is the answer. So let's just simplify this to uh, get the final answer. So 1 12th ML squared plus ML squared divided by 4. Um, so this just becomes uh, 1 12th ML squared plus uh, 3 twelfths. 3 twelfths ml square so that's 4 over 12 ml square which is 1 third ml square this actually turns out to be quite useful in doing problems this is the rotational inertia of a thin rod uh, about its uh, about an axis which passes through one end of the rod and is perpendicular to the rod right so in the next video we are going to look at a couple more examples of rotational inertia and we'll talk about rotational kinetic energy and that will uh, conclude this chapter. So I'm going to stop this video over here and I'll see you in the next video.